Good afternoon, everyone. This forum is for all of our judicial candidates from the appellate court, the circuit court, and also the seventh district sub-circuit court. My name is Ramel Terry, and I am the political action committee chair at the Chicago Westside NAACP branch. And I just want to welcome you all here today in order to learn more about the different candidates that are running for the different judicial offices and um, in order to make a more informed vote decision. We did have one of the candidates to show up today and so we're going to give her an opportunity to introduce herself to everyone here and also answer some questions from the audience and from our moderator. So I just want to thank you all for being here. We do have some ground rules um, for the candidates just to make sure you are aware of the process. We have our timekeeper that is right over to our left here. She has two cards. One says 30 seconds, the other says stop. Everyone, you know, we want to respect everyone's time, so we want to make sure that you are paying attention to those notices and make sure when she says stop, you actually stop speaking. And I'm going to turn this over to our second vice chair, Mrs. Phyllis Logan. I too want to say good afternoon to everyone and welcome out. Uh, we want to thank you for coming out, all the candidates as well as our community uh, itself. And we're being recorded by CAN TV. And CAN TV has serviced uh, Chicago for over 30 years and it has a little over 100,000, 110,000 calls and, and viewers that see the show. With that, uh, we're going to start with, as uh, Ramel stated, we're going to start with the candidates for the first uh, district appellate Gordon vacancy. We have four candidates on the uh, ballot. You were also given ballot sheets, uh, just uh, sample ballot sheets. Uh, we have uh, the person that's here today. We will move forward and we're going to allow the candidate one minute to give us some insights on herself and introduce herself to you. And then we'll get into some questions. Thank you. And thank everyone here who came out this morning because it's very important that people know who the judges are. My name is Frederina Lyle. I am a circuit court judge. I am currently sitting and assigned to the traffic and the elder law division. Elder law is a new division that we are creating now. It has not totally gone online. So until then, I'm hearing traffic cases, primarily misdemeanor, uh, DUIs, and minor traffic cases. I've practiced law for 34 years. Prior to the time that I came to the bench, actually in reverse chronological order, before I was a judge, I was the alderman of the sixth ward for 13 years on the south side. Before I represented the people on the six, of the sixth ward for 13 years, I was primarily an attorney uh, working my way up from being the associate in a small law firm to being an owner of a small law firm. I've tried cases all over Illinois. I've tried cases in Minnesota. I've tried cases in Indiana, state, federal courts. And then I went to the circuit court. I am running for a seat on the Illinois appellate court, which is a reviewing court. You have the trial court, then you have the reviewing court, and that's the appellate court, and then you have the Illinois Supreme Court. And I'm out here soliciting votes all over county. It's a countywide race. <laughs> The, the first question we will have you in one minute really tell us what the, your position as uh, an appellate court means to us. Most of the people who have decisions of trial court judges, be they in divorce, be they in probate, be they in criminal court, people that have decisions that they don't agree with have a right to appeal. Those appeals are go go to the reviewing court and I will be on the reviewing court. I will be one of the judges that reviews the action of the lower court to see whether or not they followed the law, A, whether or not equity was done, B, whether or not people's rights were property, properly protected. And so that's basically the appellate court. And if the appellate court decision is something that a litigant does not agree with, they get a right to go to the Supreme Court. Most of the world only gets to the appellate court. Very few of the cases are ever appealed up to the Supreme Court. So for all practical matters, the appellate court is the last court of review for most people, and it is the last chance to present your case, and so that's what I'll be doing. So when we present the judges, uh, it, it is your 
an opportunity to make sure that this is someone that you can feel and sense within your heart that they will work in the best interest of the not only the Illinois Constitution, <laughs> but the federal Constitution with you being in front of them. And we never know when we will stand in front of a judge. And this is an opportunity for you to get, the, get to see them from a you know, face to face, closer comfort zone, and then to be able to better understand them when they're in the robes and behind the bench. So the next question is, and you've explained to us, but I have you down as, the, as a candidate for the first district appellate uh, court. Can you explain the district itself and then what it encompasses, and uh, not only you've explained the scale in which you would work, overseeing those below in the lower courts, but also the impact of the first district. The cases that would come before me would be those cases out of Cook County. There are 24 just justices or judges. They're judges, but it's a it's a honorary title. They call them justices of the appellate court and justices of the Supreme Court. There are 24 that hear cases strictly from the Cook County, the Chicago land area. And I would sit on a panel of four. There would be another three judges that would sit on the panel, and we would review the case that would come up. It is very important that you know the judges because you're going to have more impact. A judge is going to have more impact on your life than the president. And we stand in line for hours to vote for the president. You will see a judge at some point. It may not be a bad thing. It may be a good thing that you are in court. It may be an adoption. But you are going to meet a judge sometime. You're going to be in front of that judge. You may or may not like that decision, and you may want to take it to the next level of review. And that's why you need judges on the next level also that understands the sensibilities of different communities. You don't need a judge that does not understand who you are, what your community represents. You need someone that has a diversity of ideologically, ideology as well as gender and race. Uh, what is your position on mandatory minimum sentencing and requiring sentencing enhancements? Mandatory sentences infringe on the judicial responsibility to decide what sentence is appropriate for the young person or the older person that's in front of them. If I am looking at a person and, and cannot decide that because of the situation uh, with that child or that adult, that case that I can't deviate, then it just removes all of the, the ability of the judges to actually to issue justice. So we, we have to follow the law that is in effect on the date that we decide a case. And when you're on the appellate court, you have to follow the law that is in effect on the date you're ruling on it. But generally, mandatory sentences impose on the judges judicial making power and should be frowned upon. In terms of the second question, I don't remember what the second part of that was. Well, it was uh, required in, uh, sentences enhancements. In enhancements. It's enhancements. the same thing. It, yeah. it really, the judge is, the judge hears the case. The judge looks at the defendant. The judge looks at the witnesses. The judge hears the whole case, and the judge should be able to decide within a parameter what the range and what is the appropriate sentence for that particular person. The legislators in Springfield or in Washington that look at no people, when they make these laws, are not in a better position than the judge who's there facing the defendant and the victim. Very good. Very good, I think. Okay, and this one relates closer to the community at large. Uh, what is your position on judicial activism? Do you believe in strictly following the letter of the law and explain? We take an oath to strictly follow the letter of the law, so we really can't get around that. What you can do is you can talk to legislators about massaging bad laws, and to the extent that you have the ability as an appellate court judge to write a dissenting opinion, then that dissenting opinion, it will be the losing opinion today, but three years from now that may become the winning opinion. So today's dissent may be the majority in the future. So you don't lose your voice simply because you become a member of the appellate court. If you think that the law is wrong, if you think that the justices, your fellow justices, miss something, uh, some other law, that there's a trend that you need to bring to the discussion, you bring it in a dissent, and then maybe the next time the case comes up, there'll be more people who think like you, and maybe we can make some changes in the law in that respect. 
in that regard. And then uh, one more question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. I want to get back to the first district itself. Can you give us the structure of the first district of the appellate court? The structure meaning the number of uh, members that are the judges that are, are part of the group, the group uh, going over caseload uh, cases, particular cases as a whole. Can you give us this, that structure, your work uh, job that you have? I think I might have most misspoken in the beginning if I said there were 24 panels. There are 24 justices. Okay. And we break up into panels of four. And from time to time, you reassign to change the, number, the people who are in a panel. But there are 24 justices that hear the cases out of Cook County. And you do it again in panels of four. So a case is presented. One justice is, dis, is made the lead on that particular case. And, and the justices aren't doing this in a vacuum, so don't let people tell you that they're up there writing all of their own opinions. They have law clerks, and they have people to help research it, then they have people that type it, and then once they get their positions in, they have a meeting, and they discuss it among the other three justices, and they try to come to a consensus. So you need not only the ability to read and research and write, you need some leadership ability to try to get your, your panel, if you are the lead justice on that case, your panel to go along with your particular view or to get them to consider what may be someone else's view that happens to be the right view. But that is how, it's a decision making process that's done by consensus. And again, if you think that they're wrong and they're going, every, the three of them win, you write a dissent and maybe next time your dissent will have some more converts and you can, become the majority opinion in the future. Okay, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Do you believe the current system for disciplining lawyers and judges is efficient? Why or why not? There are two different systems for disciplining judges. and There's a system for judges and there's a system from the attorneys. Uh, the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission disciplines attorneys. And depending upon whether you are the commission or whether you're the attorney that they're looking at, you have your own opinion about whether or not the process works. Some people feel that the process is um, overly cumbersome, that they do not have enough people on the actual panels that actually practice law because they hire a lot of young people straight out of law school. Some people feel that they don't do enough to protect people. So it, it's very subjective depending on where you stand. And with the judges, it's a different process totally. It's a judicial inquiry board um, that is a closed procedure and um, again, it depends on whether you are the one that's being investigated or the one that's doing the investigation. If you have problems with judges, you should definitely address the Judicial Inquiry Board. If you have problems with attorneys, you definitely should address those problems to ARDC. They will be investigated. Uh, next question from the audience. Would you favor or oppose a system in which all sentencing decisions were routinely posted online or indexed by the name of the judges or the judge? I think for the most part you can find that information now. It's not in a central repository, but as the technology becomes more and more prevalent, I think that one day you will be able to just, in fact I know the clerk can do that now. I don't know if it's generally available to um, you to do from your home where you can go online and do a Judge Lyle and get a cop, get a listing of every single decision that she's entered. It will not happen in our division, for instance, for many years simply because right now in traffic we are short. We have nine judges to do 14 calls. So on several days in the last two months, I had 67 cases in the morning and 75 in the afternoon. They are not being scanned in as we do them. So we're still writing everything out. In fact, my carpal tunnel has become an issue since I've become a judge. Uh, in some of the other divisions where they may have 12 cases in a morning, they are actually scanning the decisions in. But we are trying to get computerized and eventually that would be online. 
I don't see any problem with a system like that because once you make the decision, it is a public record. This next question possibly speaks to many of us uh, wanting to know, what if you had a problem or a situation occurred and you addressed every higher judge up and got no results? What happens at that point? I can't talk about specifics, particularly since I have no idea what specific facts are. Let me just say that a defendant has a right to do an appeal to the appellate court. They have a right to do an appeal to the state court, to the Supreme Court. If it is a criminal defendant, then they have a right, if they're grounds, to go into the federal court under what we call habeas release. Uh, relief and so there are some avenues for defendants in criminal cases there may not be that many avenues for those people who are involved in the court system and have issues in terms of civil cases um, there is once you exhaust the remedies of the court there is no other remedy other than you just standing out here on a street corner with a sign and people do that now by, doing, by going on the internet saying, I think this judge is a jerk. Be careful to, that you are absolutely certain that it's the judge that's a jerk and not your case because you also don't want to be involved in having someone sue you for liable. But you, those are, we only have certain structures set up. It is not limitless, it doesn't go on forever. And once you ex exhaust your remedies, there's really a lot you, can, lot you can do. But if you think the judge was wrong, if you think the judge was biased, if you think the judge had some particular uh, issue with you then when that judge is up for re-election, you tell everyone you know. That's really the, that's why these are still elected positions, regardless of people's attempts to make them non-elected positions. I have another question uh, from the audience. Uh, this one, I think, rate, relates to one of the, amend, uh, one of the uh, amendments uh, speaking to uh, we're all entitled to a fast and speedy trial. Uh, what can a client do when lawyers receive attorney fees and delay the case for you know, a couple of years and then resign without explanation? The Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission is the process by which you, you adjust your grievances with lawyers. Uh, as a defendant, if you have a case, if your child has a case, if your cousin's child has a case, they need to know that the only time the clock starts running in a criminal matter is once the defense attorney files a demand for trial. So if your relative needs to get this case over with, they need to talk to their lawyer about filing a demand for trial as soon as they get the discovery. But you don't want somebody saying they're ready for trial and they don't know what the evidence is against them. So you have to talk to the lawyer. You can't totally assume the lawyer is going to make the perfect decision. You have to meet and talk to your lawyer and go through it with your lawyer, asking them what, the expect, what their expectations are, what their timetable is. And if you do not believe that they are interested in moving the case along, Swiftly, then you get another lawyer, or if they withdraw after they've drawn all your money out over a year, then you go to ARDC. That's really the only option that you have. But you need to get referrals for lawyers just like you do for a dentist and a doctor and ministers. You ask people about what kind of church they go to, ask them about what kind of lawyers they have. I think we're doing well on these questions and I'm hoping that we can bring them to all levels of the court system because these are very good questions. So thank you, audience. Um, next question, what is your position on people who are indigent, can't afford the attorney that are incarcerated because they cannot afford to either pay a bond, get a family member to pay a bond, so on and so forth. What's your position? 
that's two questions. Number one, what about indigency? Yes. If you're indigent and you have a case where you could possibly or potentially be locked up, you're entitled to have the county provide you with an attorney. And at the beginning of the call in our misdemeanor courtrooms, we include that in our opening remarks. If you cannot afford an attorney, let us know. We will have you fill out a uh, affidavit of income and expenses and see if you qualify for the services of the attorneys in the public defender's offices. That does not relate if you are not facing a potential jail time. But if you have, even in a misdemeanor traffic matter, if it, you could face one day in jail, we have to provide you with an attorney. Everybody should have a lawyer. Secondly, in terms of those people who are sitting in jail right now because they cannot afford bond, President Preckwinkle has been very, very aggressive in trying to get some changes in the system to encourage more use of electronic home monitoring as opposed to persons sitting in Cook County Jail awaiting trial. I think when I was with her earlier this week, the statistics were 50 to 70 percent of the people in Cook County right now are awaiting trial. They have been found guilty of nothing. And a great percentage of those people have not been charged with violent crimes. They are there because they cannot pay a bond. And so we need to look at another method of securing their return to court because that is the purpose of bond to guarantee your appearance. It is not for pretrial punishment. What is your position on formerly incarcerated, uh, incarcerated, uh, incarcerated having their records sealed, expunged, or totally uh, restored? It took some time to get the expungement changes that have been made within the last four or five years. That was a 10-year fight just to get minor steps done in terms of expungement because there's a very large lobby down in Springfield that doesn't want any expungement or sealing of any records. Uh, unfortunately, the, and those lobbies, because they have lobbyists down there, what they want is not necessarily in the best interest of many people in our communities. We do have the right to have some records expunged now, and we think that everyone should take advantage of that right uh, to have their record expunged. They can go online to Dorothy Brown's, the clerk of the court's office, and find out what things are expungible. They should go to every one of these expungement seminars that organizations like the West Side NAACP and the clerk's office and churches do all over the city. We need to have as many young people return to employability as possible. The roots of many of our problems are poverty, and you cannot get out of poverty if you cannot get a job, and you cannot get a job with some of these X's on these young people. So we need to make sure that everyone that is available and eligible to have um, their record sealed takes advantage of it so maybe they can become gainfully employed. A restoration? Uh, once you do your time, you are presumed to have paid your debt to society, and you should be able to vote. Uh, one more question. Is that I have the last question in my hand from the audience, right? Okay, as an attorney, how many cases have you tried in the appellate court? I've made new law in Illinois on a case that uh, got the Illinois Appellate Court to announce for the first time that we have an, a right to privacy that exceeds the right. There is no right to privacy in the United States Constitution. When we had our Constitutional Convention, they put a right to privacy in the Illinois Constitution. And in 1983, I appealed the case and got the court to come down and say, yes, in fact, we do have a right to privacy. That's new good law. It was just a um, re it was just cited in last year on another case. I have overturned decisions. I've gotten new trials for defendants. I've written on brief and what we call off brief, meaning I argued some of the cases and I did not argue others. And so I would say that I've probably, I got John Steele on the ballot by taking his case to the appellate court. Uh, so I've probably successfully appealed maybe about six cases. But Let's also remember that before I became a lawyer, I didn't know how to be a lawyer. Before I became an alderman, I didn't know how to be an alderman. And I went on to learn everything I needed to know 
about doing both of those things to become a great lawyer and an excellent alderman. And I didn't know how to be a judge until I became a judge. So the fact that I haven't had 200 cases as an appellate court justice is crazy because you can only get the, that kind of ability and that kind of experience once you're on the bench. You sure? Thank you very much. So we will allow uh, Judge uh, Lyle to give us her closings. Uh, and uh, we want to thank you all for listening. And we did invite out four candidates. This is the one candidate we have today. So we appreciate her being here. So we will hear your closings. Thank you. We invited nine. I'll repeat that later. Go right ahead. Again, my name is Fredrina M. Lyle. I am on the ballot. I am running for the, it was a vacant position when I was slated for it. Uh, subsequently, two other persons got into the race, but I am running for a vacancy on the Illinois Appellate Court. I've practiced law for 34 years, including the last three years as a, uh, as a judge. I've represented my community every single day in every job that I've ever had. I will carry my passion for justice. I will carry my intellectual curiosity. I will carry my integrity. I will carry my compassion. I will carry all of those things to the appellate court with me and continue to represent my community every single day that I'm on any job. And I'm asking for your help in getting there. I think the fact that I'm the only one sitting here should be a sign to you of what some of the other people think about your votes. And so I'm here asking for your vote. I think you have to ask people to vote for you, and I'm asking you to punch 133 and vote for me. Thank you. 133 and vote for me. Thank you. And we want to, I want to correct one thing. There are several uh, candidates running for the appellate court. We invited nine out um, for the different districts that they're in. All nine should have been here because they represent Cook County. Uh, and we have to thank uh, the candidate who did show up today. And I don't want to speak to what that uh, presents in my mind, but we want to thank you again for taking your time out to speak to the people so that we can get a sense of who it is that we're voting for and who sits in those black robes behind those benches. So we want to thank you again. And once again, we want to thank everyone for coming out and good afternoon to you all. I am Phyllis Logan, uh, your moderator, as well as the second vice president for the Chicago West Side Branch NAACP. I am also the second vice president to the State of Illinois Conference of Branches, NAACP. So we'll start off with this side, Ms. Uh, Rivers. Good afternoon. I'm Crystal Rivers. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself. I look forward to the vote and becoming a judge so that I can listen fairly and apply the law accurately. My goal is to make people feel comfortable when they're before me and to make sure that they have an opportunity to tell their side so that I have all the information before I go forward. I've been an attorney for the past 17 years. I've had over 200 trials. I've had, um, of those 200 trials, 100 of those have been jury trials. I started as a prosecutor. From there, I went on to own my own business for 10 years. As a law firm owner, I did real estate law and other transactional areas like evictions, foreclosures, and things like that. For the past three years, I've worked for Lisa Madigan's office as an assistant attorney general. What I do there is I commit to a mental institution, sexually violent predators who have been convicted of sexually violent crimes and are about to be released. Instead of them being released, they are committed to a mental institution because it's found that they have a mental disorder that's causing them to act out in sexually violent ways. So they are committed to an institution so they can get treatment. So before they're released, they have the tools necessary to assure that they don't offend again. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, my name is Pat Spratt and I'm also running for the circuit court. I've been a lawyer for 22 years. 
My practice is business litigation. My clients have been corporate individuals and the city of Chicago. And one of the proudest moments in my career was representing the city of Chicago. I was on the team that defended the city's, the challenge by the, a builder's association against the city's minority and women business enterprise ordinance. My job was to meet with minority and women business owners and collect from them the stories of discrimination that they suffered through keeping them out of the building trades, and it was that evidence that I collected that convinced Judge Moran that there was a continuing need for women and minority business owners enterprise ordinance. Um, I would like to be on the Circuit Court of Cook County. I've been exposed to a lot of good lawyers and a lot of good judges, and I think I have what it takes to be on the, on the bench. I will tell you that I'm aware of the problems that are going on in the Circuit Court, as uh, President Preckwinkle has made us all aware. And I don't know if there's a global solution to the problems, but courtroom by courtroom there is a solution. And I pledge to you that I will be efficient, fair, and help in solving those problems. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Cobbs, and I am currently a judge assigned to the Circuit Court of Cook County. I've been a circuit court judge since September of 2011. Prior to becoming a judge, I served as chief legal counsel to the Supreme Court of Illinois. In 2002, the High Court appointed me as director of the Illinois courts, the constitutional officer charged to supervise and administer all levels of courts in the state of Illinois. After serving as director and working closely with the seven justices of the Supreme Court, I was offered a position on the circuit court by the seven justices who served there. I currently serve in the first municipal district of the Circuit Court of Cook County on the 11th floor. On the 11th floor, we hear predominantly civil trials, matters involving debt collection, breach of contract, claims for tortious conduct, and wage demand. I sit in a very high volume courtroom, meaning every day there are anywhere from 60 to 100 cases on my docket, and I am responsible to move that docket every day. Uh, in my courtroom, there are many litigants who come in who look just like us. My mantra to all of them is that I am fair, I'm here to hear the other side, and to dispose of the cases fairly and efficiently. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Andrea Buford, Judge Andrea Buford. I have 27, 28 years of litigation experience. Uh, I was appointed to the Supreme Court, by the Supreme Court to the bench in May of last year. I have been found highly qualified, qualified, and or recommended by all of the bar associations. I've done a lot of work within the community. I'm a past president of the Cook County Bar Association. I'm the immediate past president of the Cook County Bar Association Foundation. I'm also or the immediate past chair for the Southside NAACP Economic Development Committee. Uh, in those roles, I've had, uh, I've run a pro bono legal clinic. We did economic development workshops throughout the city and a lot of other work. I think it's important that you pay attention to who the judges are who are sitting on the bench. You pay attention to their qualifications. You can go upon all of our websites and look to see what our qualifications are, but you have to know what's in our heart and whether or not we are here to try and help. And that's my role. I'm here to help you when you come in front of me, when you come to the bench. I'm going to make sure that everything is equal, the playing field is equal, whether you're represented or not, you will get a fair hearing in front of me. You may not like my decision, but you will feel that it was fair. I hope that you will cast your vote for me. I am number 160160 on a ballot, Judge Andrea Buford. Thank you so much. I'm Judge Alfred Swanson. I've been a judge of the circuit court since the Supreme Court appointed me to the bench nearly three and a half years ago. In that three and a half years, I have sat in difficult, high volume courtrooms that demand time and attention. Currently, I'm in the Chancery Division where I've been for the last nearly three years where I hear mortgage foreclosure cases. So I see people every day who are facing serious issues. As a judge and all of us who are sitting judges and any judge make decisions every day that directly affect people's lives. And that's what I do. And I make a conscious effort to be fair and to make sure people are heard and to treat everyone with the civility and dignity I hope, would hope they would show me. The Chicago Bar Association uh, commented on me that I have extensive civil litigation experience, 
well regarded for knowledge of the law, work ethic, and fine judicial temperament. When I hear a foreclosure case, I make sure people understand the process, that they have time to try to work something out if they are able to uh, before anything adverse happens to them. I listen to people, I treat them fairly and with dignity and respect, and that's how I proceed in my courtroom. Judge Alfred M. Swanson, Jr., ballot number is 142. Good afternoon, I'm Bill Raines. I'm, uh a retired police officer, I got shot in the line of duty. I'm a former prosecutor from 26 in California and now a criminal defense lawyer. I uh, like to think that I'm, I'm well-rounded professionally. I know the problems in the community as a criminal defense lawyer. I've done hundreds of bench trials. I've done 40 criminal uh, jury trials, seven of those first-degree murder trials. Uh, I'm on the board of Sankofa Safe Child Initiative. 22 years of uh, being a lawyer. My bar ratings are all positive from every bar associate that's out there. Um, Helped cease fire when, uh, when they asked for my help. And uh, I'll wrap this up. I also am involved in the community. I do Toys for Tots, Juvenile Diabetes, and I am part of this community. I work every day with offenders who are being treated unfairly. I make sure that I stand up for them. I try cases all the time at 26 in California. I've got a good track record. My police and prosecution background gives me the insight on how to resolve these cases in, in our favor and uh, I'm looking for your help. My name is Bill Raines, punch number 154. Good afternoon, my name is Carolyn Joan Gallagher. Thank you for having us today and for this opportunity. I wanted to tell you that I grew up in the city of Chicago. I've lived in the Chicago area my entire life. I attended DePaul Law School. I have practiced law for more than 30 years. I have significant litigation experience. I've had hundreds and hundreds of commercial litigation and complex civil litigation lawsuits. I've also taught law school for four years at DePaul. But the thing that I may be most proud of is the work that I've done with the Chicago Legal Clinic, which was founded by two of my law school classmates, Ed Grossman and Father Paprocki, in 1981, when we graduated, I've worked with the Chicago Legal Clinic doing pro bono volunteer legal services ever since. In addition, I've worked at the Chancery Advice Desk, Chicago Bar Foundation uh, program in the Daily Center, working with individuals who are being foreclosed on and cannot afford representation and giving them free legal advice. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Deanna Rosario, and I'm also a candidate for judge. I'm running in the Jesse Reyes vacancy. I have been practicing law for over 24 years in both the private and public sector. The majority of my career has been in public interest law. I've worked as an assistant state attorney as a prosecutor. I've also worked in the private practice where I worked on real estate transactions and wills and helped individuals with immigration. And currently, I'm with the City of Chicago. I'm an attorney with the City of Chicago. And I work for the Department of Family and Support Services. That department handles all the social services work for the City of Chicago. I'm very involved in my community. I thank you very much for giving, us, giving me this opportunity to be here today. And I appreciate being here. Thank you. So the first question, what's your position on the formerly incarcerated? Having their records sealed, expunged, are totally restored, I think is the word. And we want to start at the end there. Uh, if you're not in the position because you've not been a judge, and I heard many of you guys say you were already in those, those positions, if you're not in the position to answer the question, then we'll accept that as your response as well, okay? One minute, and please pay attention to the uh, timer there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, yes, I'm not as currently a sitting judge but I have volunteered to work on expungement of records and I highly recommend anyone who can and has the opportunity to please go ahead and do so. It is extremely important. It's unfortunately, if you do have a criminal record, it may stop you from gaining employment or from at many times from seeking any type of certification or degree. So I highly recommend it. You can go to Dorothy Brown's website. There's also a group of attorneys called the uh, Legal, it's the um, Cabrini Green Legal Clinic, and they can also provide your help for expungement. So I highly recommend it. Thank you. 
On the topic of expungement, I know there's a program coming up this spring, and I'm sure that the information is available on the internet. Um, sometimes you can't get your record expunged, you can't get the incarceration erased, but I do believe that it's most important, once a debt to society is paid, that every individual have a chance to participate fully in society again. Again, I'm, I'm Bill Raines. Uh, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, so I deal with expungements every day. Uh, the thing that a lot of clients and, and people in general don't understand is that when your record is expunged, it's for employment purposes. It's not for law enforcement purposes. So I had a client who told me he'd never been arrested before when he had a, a, a back, criminal background, and I showed him the rap sheet that they gave me. And I says, this is not gone. You know? So maybe if you apply for a job, it doesn't show up which is perfect. This is one of the reasons why we have expungements. But the reality is, is that this crime is still on your rap sheet. So we talk about the difference between sealing your records, which then comes off your rap sheet, versus expunging it for employment purposes. And I agree with what's been said earlier. Uh, people have served a debt to society. They need to be forgiven in the sense that they've already paid their penance. They need to have opportunity because right now a convicted felon, and I do mainly felony cases, they're done. They're not gonna get a good job. They're not going to get loans. They're not going to be able to get a job with, uh, that requires any type of security clearance, policemen, firemen, uh, at the airport, anything like that. They're trapped. And all I can say is that it's a good tool. Let's use it and take advantage of it. Thank you. I'm Judge Alfred Swanson. I'm on a civil call, but I will say this about uh, expungement. If you can qualify for it, and the law is very specific about the criteria and when uh, records can be expunged or sealed, if you think you want to qualify, ask for it. It never hurts to ask. You won't receive the relief if you don't ask for it. So if you think that's a possibility, put the request in. You may be successful. You may not be. But guaranteed, if you don't ask, you won't be successful uh, in that. And I agree with what uh, Bill, my colleague, said. You have to uh, apply for it. Expungement applies uh, for employment purposes. That record is there and remains. Uh, Bill is absolutely correct in that. But if you think you can qualify, ask for it. I'm Judge Alfred Swanson. Hi, I have uh, <clears throat> worked with the expungement summits. I've participated as a volunteer attorneys. The attorneys of the Cook County Bar Association are uh, staffing those expungement summits, but it's a sad, sad thing because there are many offenses that are not expungible. I've seen people stand in long lines for hours trying to get in to see an attorney to have their records expunged, only to find out that the offense is not expungible. Most of them are not. That's an unfortunate thing. However, that's the legislature that has to change the law. The judges, we can't, we can't do that. They have to legislate that change in the law. My pie in the sky idea is to expunge everybody's record, give everybody a second chance from here on out, because like someone down there said, once you have that record, you can't do anything. You can't get a job, you can't go to school, you can't do anything, you're stuck. And if we would just give everybody a second chance, but that's my pie in the sky idea, and that has to be done by the legislature. Thank you. I'm Judge Cynthia Cobbs, and I would echo the comments of many of the uh, individuals who shared the panel with me this morning. As a sitting judge, I participated in the expungement sem seminars, which are hosted annually throughout the county by Clerk Dorothy Brown. Those same seminars are hosted in some of our downstate circuits, and it is encouraging uh, to see the numbers of individuals who seek to have their records expunged so that they might again become contributing members of society. Um, it is a tool that is available. I applaud the legislature for doing that and for putting that process in place. But as Judge Buford indicates, I believe that the legislature could and should do more. And they likely will. Um, but it takes from the community and from judges uh, some insight and some direction and some prompting to do the same. So I would encourage every individual, if you believe you have a right to expungement, to seek out the same. Thank you. You know, we have a federal law that, uh, that allows people who've gone into serious debt to go through bankruptcy and they come out with what is called a fresh start. And that w that's what we should have for people who qualify for expungement and not just for um, the teenagers. And I've worked with teenagers. I worked down at Hubbard High School with their mock trial team and some of those teenagers were applying for college and they knew that they were going to have a problem because they had something on their record and we got them 
to get their records expunged. There's a program that was on WTTW this week. I cannot remember the young lady's name. Uh, she's now a college student, and she's working. If I could have on demand here right now, I would find that for you and refer you to it. She's working very heavily in the, in the high schools and in the colleges to help those students get their records expunged. If you qualify for uh, sealing of the record, that's important too, because everybody, just like people in debt, deserve a fresh start. Thank you. My name is Crystal Rivers. I agree with everything that the panel has said. It is a shame that just because someone has committed a crime, but once they have served out their time, be it them being incarcerated or them being on some form of probation, that they then can't get into schools, they can't get a job, and it follows them around for the rest of their lives, creating a permanent underclass of those people. Those things should be changed. Fortunately, there are ceilings and there are expungements that can do that. And as mentioned, it can't do it for every crime, but it does exist and it should be expanded. I've worked on expungement summits for many years. I think I've done at least a dozen of them throughout my career in hopes of helping people who have been in the criminal justice system to not be trailed around with that albatross on their neck for the rest of their lives. So I'm definitely for it and I'd like to, uh, again, thank you for your time. Crystal Rivers. I think I'm going to ask this question anyway. I was going to allow you guys uh, the opportunity to chime it in uh, as far as what uh, what the credentials are. Well, actually, what does the position itself hold? So as a judicial candidate for the circuit court, I'm understanding that's all that's what you guys are all here for. Can you please describe to the audience? Uh, what that position entails. So if just one person, so if I can just get one person to, if you want to describe that position to us. Uh, and can we get the mic down? Thank you. I'm Judge Alfred Swanson. The circuit court is uh, the trial court. We are the judges you first see when a case comes uh, before the court, whether it's in traffic court or a criminal court or someplace else, we are the ones who make the first decision on what should happen with that, with that case. The appellate court reviews our decision if somebody asks the appellate court to, but we are the ones who deal with the people directly, and we are responsible uh, for that. And I think all of us who are judges and those who are candidates for judge as well take that obligation very, very seriously because it is important that we have sensitivity to people, that we give everybody uh, a fair hearing, and we treat them with dignity and respect. That's what we have to do as we look at the facts that are presented, judge the credibility of the witnesses, the credibility of the documents, the validity of the arguments on either side, and make a decision. Some of us will preside over jury trials where we have to manage the jury, and the jury makes the decision. But many of us, such as myself, are the sole decision makers, and we have to do that with fairness, sensitivity, and equal treatment for everybody. Okay, I think, I'm hoping everyone got that, thank you. Okay, so we will start with the, the candidate to your left, if you could pass the mic, and then we'll swing it back this way. Thank you. Trying to do something to make sure we all get the, you know. What can, this is the next question for everyone, you have one minute, what can be done to get timely trials in Cook County? Well, I only have a minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, again, I'm a criminal lawyer, so that we can do that by filing a, a demand for trial. And that would be a written demand that's given to the judge, letting the state and the court know that we're demanding trial. And it's 120 days if it's out of custody, or in custody, and I think it's 180 if it's out of custody. So if this case is dragging on, especially somebody who's incarcerated, because there's way too many people who cannot bond out. And I'm on board with Tony Preckwick when she talks about the inequity of people being able to make bond and getting stuck in jail waiting for a trial. Um, the issue becomes getting people out. So from my perspective, if it's going to be, if the state's attorney, the cops don't show up, which is a problem, if, the, um, if there's an issue with getting the police reports, you file your demand for trial. I know there's similar issues with the civil side of the court, which could be addressed by uh, those that handle the civil stuff, but criminal. If your liberty's taken away and you're sitting in a cell waiting for, for your trial or waiting for the job to get done, your lawyer needs to be on top of this and file a demand for trial. And that's the only way that you can get this Speedy Trial Act moving is to file a demand. 
I currently sit in a civil trial division, uh, and I hear civil trials all day. One of the most important things that a judge can do to make certain that trials proceed timely and are disposed of effectively and efficiently is to grant continuances with great prudence. Often it is the judge who has the responsibility to make certain that the attorneys and the parties are moving cases along expeditiously. So when parties appear before a judge and you become familiar with a particular case, it's important that you inquire of both the plaintiff and the defendant where they are in terms of the case. If they're asking to continue the trial for purposes of engaging in discovery, you should inquire what discovery is anticipated and how long each party will have to com complete it. And then you should set particular deadlines and you set status dates. And when they come back to report on status as the judge, you should ask them how far they proceeded, what has been completed, and how much time they need to complete the tasks that have been assigned to them by the court. So it's the judge's job to move cases efficiently, to grant continuances only if necessary, and to be certain to be clear and firm with the parties that the case needs to come to conclusion expeditiously. Um, next question, what is your position on people who are indigent, can't afford the attorney that are incarcerated because they cannot afford to either pay a bond, get a family member to pay a bond, so on and so forth? Thank you, and Diana Rosario. Again, the work that I do, I've always worked in public interest law and I've worked with um, in social services. So I really believe that there is a need to help individuals um, to make sure that they can, uh, if they cannot afford an attorney, then they should, the state or the county should have attorneys available to them. For example, public defenders who are there and are ready, willing, and able to help out many of these individuals to help them with their cases. So I think that's one of the ways that we can um, help individuals who cannot afford attorneys. If you're incarcerated, there would be another possibility to also have um, public defenders, there's attorneys, there's groups of lawyers out there who also provide pro bono legal services, there's non-for-profit organizations who are available um, with attorneys to also help out these individuals. Thank you, Diana Rosario. Carolyn Joan Gallagher. Um, I am a civil attorney, meaning I don't do much criminal work. And I can tell you that in the civil or the non-criminal arena, there is not an option such as the public defender for those who cannot afford representation. And that's part of the reason why I've been so involved with the Chicago Legal Clinic which started out with a small office on 95th Street and now uh, has five offices throughout the Chicago area. And we serve thousands of uh, clients every year. People who cannot afford to pay much or cannot afford to pay anything can still get representation. There are other such groups in the Chicago area and the funding of those organizations is critical. And often there's a lot of reliance on the private attorneys, the big law firms, we do fundraisers twice a year. Um, and it's not that difficult if you can reach out and find that help, it should be available. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, Bill Raines again. Um, public defenders are probably the biggest resource for people that are indigent. That's what they're there for. Now saying that, being a private attorney, a lot of public defenders, they have, they're overworked, they've got a lot of cases, with, and I'm not trying to pick on them, but many of them want to just close files. And the, the sad part about that is, and I could tell you many stories, where they go back to the cell and say, look, you're pleading guilty today, you're, I'm getting you supervision, you're lucky you're not going to jail. You know, that's not how we do business. That's not, not good. So when I say that, public defenders are really the last resort, um, but there are, if there's multiple defendants and there's conflicts, oftentimes the court will appoint a private lawyer who then bills the county a certain agreed amount per hour, like $90 per hour, uh, to represent these clients. And I have been appointed by the court in the past, um, and basically that's, I think that's the better way of doing it, but the public defenders are there, and most of them do a great job. Their hearts are in it, they believe in it, and the reality is, is if you're indigent, that's probably the way it's gonna end up going for you. All right. 
Judge Alfred Swanson. I sit on a civil call at the Daily Center, and uh, we have resources available, lists of referral sources uh, for people who are indigent, where they can uh, go and explore the possibility of free legal uh, assistance in the county's foreclosure mediation program Chicago volunteer legal services represents people who do not have lawyers who want to participate in the mediation program those services uh, can be available for those who qualify that's on the civil side we've already explored as bill has and others the public defender as a defense resource uh, for uh, the criminal side but those resources are there as a judge, I have them available to where I can give people leads to where they can go uh, to obtain uh, representation or assistance with representation uh, if they need it, and we use those resources. I'm Judge Alfred Swanson. I'm Judge Andrea Buford, and you've heard about the public defender being available for services on the criminal side. As someone said, you may not like their services, but they are there. As I sit in the traffic division, and we have a lot of people believe it or not, who are taken out of the traffic division to jail. We do appoint public defenders to represent those people. Everybody cannot afford the services of a private attorney, although some of them may work on a sliding scale. We do, on the civil side, as someone else has mentioned, there are a number of associations or organizations that provide pro bono or reduced sliding scale legal services, including uh, places like the Cook County Bar Association. You can call uh, the Bar Association and get a uh, recommendation for an attorney who will practice in your area. And as Judge Swanson said, the judges keep a list of other uh, options for you to contact. But it really is unfortunate that uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you may not do so well in courts. And that's why you need uh, sensitive judges on the bench. We, we recognize that, and we try to equalize the playing field for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Buford. Judge Cobbs, again, uh, and again, I sit on a civil trial. On my bench, I keep with me a list of resources for individuals who, when they step forth, and they explain to me as the judge that they're either seeking legal representation and they can't afford it, or they simply don't know where to look. I spend some time with those litigants explaining to them that there are resources, the Cook County Bar Association, the Chicago Bar Association, there are law schools that have referral services and legal clinics. I hand to those defendants or those plaintiffs that document which enables them to seek out legal representation. Additionally, in the Daily Center, we have on the sixth floor what we call the help desk. Frequently, I will explain to a litigant what they need to do as a next step without overstepping my bounds as being a judge but sending them to the help desk to get some additional help or resource in proceeding to the next step in litigation. So there are resources available on both the criminal side and on the civil side. Thank you. Pat Spratt again. Uh, I'm a civil practitioner and I know that um, if, you are if you're a plaintiff, if you're the person who's injured, you can always get a lawyer to represent you on contingency, which is you don't have to put up the money but when you get a judgment, the lawyer will take a certain percentage of it. If you're not in a, a personal injury arena and you have a matter like a social security matter or something like that, each and every one of the law schools in the city of Chicago have legal clinics. Uh, in Northwestern, uh, Loyola, DePaul, Kent, and uh, University of Chicago. And many of them will take cases all the way through trial. It gives the law students an opportunity to hone their craft and it helps people who cannot afford lawyers. Um, the bar associations all have referral services for private attorneys who work pro bono. A lot of the large law firms do. I know Jenner and Black has a wonderful pro bono program. And the help desk at the at Circuit Court of Cook County, as Judge Cobbs pointed out, I've been in that room many, many times and I've seen a lot of people, especially with the recent spate of foreclosures, get a lot of help from the, the people at the Circuit Court of Cook County helping them find legal representation. So it's out there. You just need to have the resources available to you to know where to go. Crystal Rivers. Many people are surprised to learn that if you're ever accused of a crime, you will have an attorney appointed to you if you're indigent. But if you have a child support issue or a traffic issue or other issues in the civil arena, you are not appointed an attorney. 
it's a wonderful idea and a great thing that Judge Cobbs does, which is provide a list, and I know other attorneys on, excuse me, other judges on the panel do the same, provide lists to the litigants who come before them for matters that are civil, where they are not, they do not have a constitutional right to an attorney who will represent them for free. It's quite unfortunate because it gives a litigant who cannot afford someone to, um, to uh, not have the counsel that's needed, which puts them, of course, in a position where they can't defend themselves as well as they could if they were provided an attorney. There are tons of legal organizations and law firms that do provide pro bono work. However, they're not enough. I think one thing that law schools should do is teach the responsibility of lawyers, which is to give pro bono, give free pro bono work. Thank you. Thank you. And for the sake of the audience uh, uh, candidates, uh, can you just show of hands how many are sitting judges now? Okay, got that? Okay, the next question is going to be roughly, uh, still a minute. Are you, and this is for everyone, are you in favor of juvenile life sentences? And if you are, why? If you're not, why? One minute. Without having a specific case in front of me, it's um, extraordinarily difficult to think of something that would require a child whose brain is not formed, who has not had the proper education or background or support or love or care to determine that that child should spend the rest of their lives in jail. It seems relatively impractical as a punishment for a child. However, again, without seeing the uh, exact evidence, I could not say one way or the other. However, I can say that it is, um, it would be extraordinary circumstances that I cannot think of that would cause a child to need to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Here's where I can just say me too. I, I really like Ms. Rivers' answer. I think that children best benefit from early intervention rather than harsh prison sentences, life sentences. You can, at a very young age, you can still help somebody and bring them back into the fold, so to speak, and make a, a, a really a good, strong citizen out of them. I, I, life sentences for children just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you, Judge Cobbs, again, and uh, I am going to simply rely a little bit on my clinical social work background where I worked with children and families for about 12 years uh, in my early professional career. I would echo the sentiments of my um, panel mates uh, in identifying or in finding it difficult to identify a set of circumstances that would require or mandate a life sentence for a child. I think that as a sitting or a trial judge, one must assess all of the facts and circumstances attendant to a particular case. When I was the director of the Illinois courts, I had the opportunity to develop standards for the delivery of probation services, not just for adults, but for juveniles as well. And the important issue there for even uh, juveniles was to determine whether or not that juvenile was coming with particular risk factors that might inform whether he or she would recidivate or uh, commit a similar crime. And so those are all the factors, uh, or you have to look at all of the factors and the circumstances of any particular case. And I would be hard pressed to find one where I would be so set upon finding uh, a life sentence appropriate for a juvenile. And I have to agree with the rest of the panel members. I can't imagine anything that a juvenile who has not formed the requisite brain pattern or whatever you want to call it to be sentenced to life for anything uh, that's just un unimaginable but we need to look at ways to help our youngsters our young people our juveniles before they get caught up in the system uh, I you know if we if there's a juvenile who has uh, been convicted of a crime we need to look at alternative uh, ways to help that person. As with adults, we need to look at alternatives other than throwing people in jail and housing them in jails. I just can't imagine a, uh, a juvenile committing any kind of crime that will require a life sentence. Just can't. Judge Buford. 
uh, Judge Alfred Swanson, nor can I imagine, uh, think about a crime now that a juvenile would be entitled to or subject to a uh, sentence of life imprisonment. I think it is important, as my panel mates have said, uh, that we focus as a society on education and bringing people uh, along in, to understand right and wrong and to help out of the poverty trap and education so they can move on and have productive jobs. We need to do that as a society. But as far as people charged with, uh, with crimes, uh, I cannot imagine a case where a juvenile would be subject to a life sentence. That said, as a judge, I have to follow the law and apply the facts of a particular case to that law. I just am hard pressed to find a case, a circumstance where it would fit. Judge Alfred Swanson. Almost judge, uh, Bill Raines. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we're all on the same page here. We're all in agreement that it's going to take a pretty horrific type of case to put somebody, especially a teenager, in jail for the rest of their lives. And you're talking 60, 70, 80 year sentences. Uh, what comes to mind is the 13 year old girl up in Lake County who stabbed her 11 year old sister to death like 30 times uh, with a kitchen knife because they were arguing about chores. She's 13 years old and they're thinking of charging her as an adult. I mean, I, even in that kind of situation, it's hard pressed to put a 13 year old in jail for the rest of her, her life. So the reality is I am in agreement with the panel. I think that it's very hard pressed uh, to think about a, a teenager, when I'm talking teenager, I'm talking 13, 14, 15 years old, who does something silly or stupid and the only thing you go to jail for the rest of your life for is a murder, right? I mean, they're not going to jail for the rest of their life if they rob somebody or if they steal something, it's gonna be a murder case. And you have to look at the circumstances behind that. You have to look at the facts, you have to weigh the issues and that decision comes into play and I agree. 99.9% .9 of the time, and I'm not a sitting judge, is that you're not looking at a life sentence. Carolyn Joan Gallagher. Look, we've all made mistakes. We've all needed help. As a lawyer, but really as a mother of three, I cannot imagine a child being in that kind of trouble and facing that kind of question, or a judge having to face that kind of question, I think we'd all be in favor of getting a child help, support, therapy, medication, uh, other kinds of accountability and, and, and ways to rehabilitate this child and get him the assistance that he or she needs. Thank you. Tim? Thank you. I pretty much agree with everyone here on the panel also. Um, it would, I, it's very difficult for me to see or understand a child. It, it's pretty impractical to see them having to go to jail for the rest of their lives. Um, I do want to say that in the city of Chicago, we do have a program. It's called Juvenile Intervention. It's a relatively new program where we intervene. We bring a child who has been arrested for a crime, and it's so far we haven't really focused on egregious crimes, but we try to give them case management, try to help them look at their background, their community. Are they being raised by parents? Are they being raised by their grandparents? What are the issues and concerns and why they're not going to school? And we try to intervene, give them case management, try to help them so that they don't go to jail, but they do get some help. Thank you. This is a question I want you to carry with you because this question actually relates to possibly uh, a sitting judge already. Uh, what is, and you can carry this question with you maybe to the next uh, audience and we'll be able to, you know, if you get the opportunity to respond to it. But there's concern with judges not uh, pushing uh, for resources to individuals who are serving life, but they cannot have their briefs read due to not having uh, money, um, you know, and they have a good case. So, you know, we have individuals in the audience, our family members that we're concerned about, who are sitting on a brief that should be read but cannot afford for it to get to the court system. So we want the judges to start pushing for those resources to help those individuals out who are indigent, have no means to get a good case brief read before a judge. So just think on that and uh, you know, these, the audience will follow you throughout your still uh, campaign. 
We're going to give you one minute to sum everything else up and tell us why we should vote for you. You got one minute. And uh, speak to the camera because you're selling yourself today. Okay? Thank you. Diana Rosario, and by the way, my ballot number is 158. Um, again, I've been practicing law for over 24 years. I've worked both in the private and public sector. The majority of my career has been in public interest law, and what that means is that I've worked in government, I've worked with the public, and for the public. I currently work with individuals who are in need of financial and supportive services. These are people who are homeless, they're ex-offenders. They are the elderly. Um, we focus on fraud and abuse cases. We work with victims of domestic violence. I believe that I have the knowledge, the skill. I'm known for being very fair, very impartial, uh, unbiased individual. I'm very compassionate, and I feel that working with the public has helped me to be that way, and I feel that being a judge, I will represent well the public and, con and continue doing a great job. So I believe that I will make a great judge, and I um, hope for your support and for your vote. Thank you. Carolyn Joan Gallagher. I have significant experience, more than 30 years in private practice. And what I'm more proud of is the more than 30 years that I've spent giving pro bono services, free legal services and advice to all kinds of clients. I believe that everybody should be treated with dignity and respect, whether I'm representing them through one of our pro bono organizations or whether I'm the judge in the courtroom. I want everyone to feel respected, welcomed, and treated fairly in my courtroom. And I hope you'll vote for me, Carolyn Joan Gallagher, 153. Thank you. You know, they say we do churches on Sundays, and I like to say this, and the um, way to remember somebody's name is to hear it three times. So here we go. Bill Raines, Bill Raines, Bill Raines. For Can TV, four times, Bill Raines. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a real person. I think from what you've heard from me today, I tell it like it is. I don't sugarcoat much. It is what it is. But the most important thing is I'm out here every single day. I'm at 26 in California. I'm trying cases. I'm dealing with, with people who have significant problems in their lives. And we talked about expunging. I do everything in my power to make sure these young kids, when I say kids, I mean kids, do not walk out of that courtroom with a felony conviction because it's difficult, if not impossible, to correct that problem. I do everything in my power. When I say everything, I mean conferences with the judge, I, mitigation letters, Get them to get their GED. I'll get continuances so they can come in with an education. Make sure that they present themselves and I can present on their behalf an opportunity for them to have a life. Um, I treat others the way I'd like to be treated. It's a golden rule. Um, I've got 34 years in the law, 22 of those years as a uh, attorney. So when I talk about why vote for me, because when you see me on the bench, you're gonna be treated fairly with respect, but I've got the experience to be there. I've done, I've done it, I'm well-rounded, thank you. And Bill Raines, 154. I'm Judge Alfred Swanson. My ballot number is 142. People should vote for me. You should vote for me and support me because I'm qualified. If I'm qualified or recommended by every one of the bar associations that race judicial candidates, I'm honest. I've been praised for my uh, ethics and temperament. I'm experienced. Nearly three and a half years as a judge, all of those on volume court calls. Where I sit now in the Chancery Division, I have about 5,500 cases on my docket that I am responsible for managing. The average in the Circuit Court of Cook County is about between 250 to 350 cases. I'm responsible for 5,500 cases. I see people every day who are facing dire circumstances, possibility of losing their homes. The final order I enter in one of those cases is when I confirm a judicial sale and tell, give somebody a date when they have to be out of their home. And I have received letters from people and I've heard from people thanking me for how they were treated in my courtroom because I treat everybody with dignity and respect. That's the way I operate my courtroom. That's the way I operate my life. Judge Alfred M. Swanson, Jr., ballot number is 142. Hello again, Judge Andrea Buford, ballot number 160. I thank you again for the opportunity to address this audience. I do want you to know that my qualifications are available on my website or my Facebook page or my literature. They are impeccable. 
highly recommended, highly qualified, and on and on. But I don't want to tell you about that. I want to uh, finish by telling you about myself as a person. I sit in the traffic court. If you have not been in front of me, I'll bet you someone you know has been in front of me, a family member, a friend, or somebody will come in front of me. My 27, 28 years of practicing has told, it explained to me the type of judge I want to be and the type of judge I don't want to be. When you come in my courtroom, you'll get a smiling face. You'll get a nice person. You'll get a person who is going to be very respectful of you and address you as Mr. or Miss. If you're 17 years old, you will be Mr. or Miss in the courtroom, and I expect everybody else in the courtroom to treat you the same way. There's a level of respect that should be accorded to everyone who comes into the courtroom, and you should respect the court uh, in exchange. Uh, I could tell you a lot of stories about many cases and people that have come in front of me and what I've done for them or tried to do for them, but I can't because she's holding up that stop sign. <laughs> so remember, one six zero vote Andrea Buford. Uh, go to the bottom of the ballot. Please don't forget the judges. It's very important. You'll see us before you see the president. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Buford. Judge Cynthia Cobbs, my punch number is 151. Above the Supreme Court entryway are these words, Aldi alterum partum. Hear the other side. Those words are just as important in my courtroom as they are in the Supreme Courtroom. Every day I hear litigants and I invite them to tell me their side. I hear, I listen, I understand, and oftentimes I even explain. I have been found qualified by the Cook County Bar Association, the Chicago Bar Association, and recommended or highly recommended by various bar associations who serve as part of the alliance. I am endorsed by the Cook County Bar uh, Democratic Party as well as the Chicago Federation of Labor. And and other individuals whose names you might likely know. I am asking you for your support and for your vote on March 18th for me and for other judges who have been found qualified by the bar associations. Again, my name is Judge Cynthia Cobbs. I am a sitting court circuit judge. I am, my punch number is 151 and I ask again for your support. Thank you. Hi again, Pat Spratt, my number is 155 and my slogan is gonna be Punch 155 to let justice thrive. I have 47 years experience in the legal profession, 22 years of it as a lawyer. I've, I've handled hundreds of trials. Uh, all of us have similar backgrounds in that regard. What differentiates me is I'm also taught at a law school level. I taught at Loyola Law School and helped develop young legal minds. I, t I coached the Hubbard High School mock trial team, and in doing that for eight years, I also worked one-on-one -on -one with the high school students, many of whom were at risk, and many of whom went on and graduated from college, so I'm proud of that. I'm also a member of the Supreme Court Committee on Professional Responsibility. That's the committee that advises the Supreme Court of rules that govern how lawyers behave, and we've heard from time to time how lawyers have misbehaved, so I'm helping to keep them on track there. I would like to serve you as a judge in the Circuit Court of Cook County. I bring with me all my experience. I bring with me fairness, integrity, and I'm recommended by every bar association that has issued its, its recommendations so far. Thank you very much. I'm Crystal Rivers. My punch number is 145. My website is rivers for the number four judge.org. As I said, I've been an attorney for the past 17 years, and what I've come to learn is, let's face it, nobody ever wants to go before a judge and be a litigant. They're afraid, they're worried, they're spending money, they could either be put in jail or they may lose on a case. They walk in nervous. It's up to the judge to help make sure that that person at least feels comfortable. The judge is the referee who has to make sure that that person is allowed to get out their story, allowed to tell the facts, so that ultimately justice can be done. No one should walk into a courtroom terrified of the judge. And I can promise you, if elected, no one will be terrified of me because I am rude or anything like that. I will respect everyone who presents themselves in front of me and I'll make sure that everyone receives a fair trial. I've been endorsed by the Democratic Party of Cook County. I'm one of the slated candidates. I've also received the endorsement of the FOP Lodge 4, along with many other endorsements. Please visit my website. I've been found rated and qualified by many bar associations. I believe my time is up, but again, I'd like to say thank you very much. Crystal Rivers, Punch 145, thank you. Thank you, and thank you. 
Good afternoon. I am Phyllis Logan, your moderator, as well as the second vice president for the Chicago West Side Branch NAACP, as well as the second vice president for the uh, Illinois State Conference of Branches of the NAACP. And we welcome you, our audience, out to our candidates forum for the seventh district sub-circuit uh, for the vacancy that's being held by Taylor. Is that correct, candidates? Very good. We have two candidates. There's three for this race. All three were invited out. And what we uh, will do is we'll start with the candidates giving us a one minute uh, presentation on who they are and why they seek this office. And then our next question will be, and we'll ask the candidates to describe for us what the seventh district sub circuit uh, position, uh, a description of that position. Okay, so if we'll start with uh, Mr. Owens. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Owen Shelby. Uh, I am a West Sider, born and raised. I grew up around the corner on Central and Division. I attended uh, Providence St. Mel High School, Morehouse College, and Chicago Kent College of Law. Uh, I've been a prosecutor now for the last uh, six years. I've been an attorney for seven years. I've chosen to remain a prosecutor because I do care about our community and what happens to our people in the criminal justice system. On a day-to-day -day basis, I am in the courtrooms. Our trial calls usually are 30 to 40 cases per day. I'm responsible for 30 to 40 families. Their decisions rest in my hands on a day-to-day -day basis. I've recently been promoted to another division where we actually go out to the scene. We go to the hospitals, jail cells, people's houses to talk with the victims, to talk to the families, to make sure we get the case right. I'm heavily involved in the community. I mentor youth. I coach youth basketball. I love this community and I want to be a part of it and I'm asking for your support. My name is Judge Mary Ann Jackson. I'm an associate judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County and I've been involved in the law for 40 years. 16 years as a judge, 24 years as a lawyer. In that 40 years, every facet of the law I have been involved with. As I said, I've been a judge, criminal defense attorney, federal prosecutor, state court prosecutor, taught law students, taught lawyers. I've done it all. I even wrote an article for the uh, Illinois Institute of Continuing Legal Education. I am assigned to the Juvenile Justice Division. I've been there for 14 years in that division. Every kid that gets arrested in the Austin area comes in my courtroom. And so I am committed to redirecting our children's lives away from guns, gangs, drugs, death, and destruction. So the first uh, question, I want to go back to that again. Can you tell us uh, the descriptive of the position for the seventh district sub-circuit? All judges are the same. It's simply a question about how you come to the bench. You can run countywide or you can run in a sub-circuit. The seventh judicial sub-circuit is a large part of the west side of the city of Chicago, has a big part of Berwyn, part of Cicero. Uh, we run all the way from Austin down to the Chicago River. The borders on the north and south change. Uh, they start out at North Avenue and just past 22nd Street or 26th Street. And by the time you get downtown, it's like Kinsey. So that, that's what it is. So. River Forest and Forest Park. But uh, it is a way for people from a particular geographical area to elect someone from that particular community to the bench. Did you want to add some more on to? Or oh, no, that's OK, thank you. Thank I'm a you. lifelong West Sider. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is a question for both of you guys. And, and we're starting off with uh, what challenges now we'll go with this one here from the audience. What differentiates you from the other candidates? And we'll start with, uh, let's start with you, Judge. Uh. Well, as I said, uh, 40 years differentiates me from this young man. I've told him before, I respect and admire him. And he is the type of young man that we want to see in our community. But he d he's not there yet, in my humble opinion. I think he will be there. But 40 years versus six years, that's what differentiates me. The nature and the kind of experience that I have. And I believe that experience matters. Uh, it bothers me when in this town, when you talk to people about your experience, sometimes they want to roll their eyes up in the top of the head because they think who you know ought to be more important than what you know. 
I know that I've been involved in the law 40 years, and I've done all aspects of it, and I believe that's what makes me the best qualified candidate. Again, I would just like to say I've chosen to stay a state's attorney because I care about our people. As I said, our caseloads are 30 to 40 cases per day. That's 30 to 40 families who trust in me to make the right decision. I've been asked to go into private practice. Even when I decided to run from judge, people asked me, what are you doing? Why don't you get out there and make some money? I chose to remain a state's attorney because I care about the community. My new assignment, I don't even go to court anymore. Right now, for the last few months, for the next eight months, we go to the crime scenes. I go to the hospitals and talk to the victims. I go to jail cells. I go to police stations. So that's the kind of work, and those are the type of qualities I am connected with this community. I'm also, I'm highly involved in the community. I speak at career days. I speak at um, community outreach programs. I volunteer. I coach youth basketball. Additionally, my candidacy is about being a symbol of hope for our community. It's for all of our young kids. I hope to encourage them to, when they set their goals as something, that's exactly what you do. So that's what my candidacy is about, being a symbol of hope, and I'm very qualified for this position. Okay, the next question. Do you believe the current system for disciplining lawyers and judges is effective? Why and why not? So we'll start with you, sir. Well, there are two separate systems. There's one system for the judges and there's one system for the attorneys as well. Now, I personally have not been involved uh, in that system. I have not had any complaints against my attorney's, attorney license, but I do know it is a, I believe it can be effective, but it does take a lot of work. You do have to be committed to, committed to if you're complaining. So it's kind of biased. It depends if you're the one who the charges are being brought against or if you're the one that's making the charges. So I think it is kind of subjective and it probably needs someone who's actually experienced that to really tell their opinions about it. I think the system is very effective at disciplining lawyers and judges. Uh, when you get, as an attorney, when you get a, law, a letter from the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission, you realize you have only so long to respond to that letter, and if you do not respond to the letter, the next letter you get might be a letter telling you that you are a subject to being suspended from the practice of law until you respond to that letter. So it's not like you can avoid ARDC. I was in private practice for 18 years, and I probably had a half a dozen lawyers, I mean, clients write letters. Clients lose, they grumble about you, they write a letter. But you get a chance to defend yourself, the panel makes a decision. Same thing about judges. If somebody gripes about a judge, the, L the judicial inquiry board is going to get in touch with you, and trust me, no judge wants to see mail coming from the judicial inquiry board. This question comes from, um from a different perspective, what do you do when you are arrested and shuffled around in the jail system? How about, how about that one? Judges are not permitted to practice law, so I can't tell a person legally what they need to do, but obviously they are in need of a lawyer when you're being shuffled around in the system. Uh, I recognize that some people cannot afford uh, attorneys, so I'm an advocate for making lawyers be involved in more prono, pro bono work. There are large law firms, there are a bunch of lawyers sitting there making a whole lot of money. You need to be required. Uh, there are some uh, pro bono requirements, Now I think there ought to be more. But the bottom line is, you need a lawyer. And I would just agree with that. Uh, judging from the question, if you are shuffled around in the system, uh, if we're talking about there's arrests and different things on your background, you may need a lawyer so that you can file for expungement or you can participate in some of the programs that the county offers. I myself, I have done a couple of uh, expungement seminars as well. So I would just add that. So, you know, how can we better educate our younger people, our younger um, adults about the judicial system? What, what mechanisms are in place for just teaching? Well, one thing is that the courts are open to the public. You can go in to most courtrooms. You can sit there. You can watch what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. You can look at the prosecutors. You can look at the public defenders, the private attorneys. You can even look at the judges and, you know, just form your own opinions about what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's every courthouse from Cook County to Maywood to Bridgeview, Markham. There, And even if you 
talk with someone there, a lot of times they'll let you speak with the state's attorneys. Uh, in my courtrooms, we have had a lot of visitors. They'll stick around. They ask questions of us about what we're doing, what are, what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the judge, most judges are polite. Most judges will even talk to the visitors. So that's one thing I would say. Just go out to the courtrooms and make your presence known and let them know you want to know more about the, the court, the, judi the judicial system. This is true, you can do that, but I would like to also urge community groups. You ought to invite judges out uh, to come speak. You know, block clubs, you ought to invite judges out to come speak. Churches, ought to invite judges out to come speak. You know, at selection time, and of course, candidates show up and they say to them, you, you want to stand up, uh, say a few words. You ought not be asking judges to stand up and say a few words. You ought to want to hear a whole lot from a judge. A judge is a very powerful person. I can go to work tomorrow, enter an order that will affect every man, woman, and child in the state of Illinois. So you ought to get, want to get to know us. Trust us, we want to get to know you all. Our next question, what is your thoughts on term limits for judges? Both of you guys, your thoughts on term limits. Is there a statute of limitation on time uh, to discipline a judge? It's a twofold. So what's your uh, thoughts on term limits? And then is there a statute of limitation on time to discipline an attorney? So. Start with you, uh, Ms. Uh, no, there, there, there is no uh, term limits for judges. Uh, once a judge is elected, the only thing a judge has to do after then is stand for retention. Uh, and with circuit court judges, they come up for retention every six years. And they are required to get 60% of the votes of the number of people who vote. So that's 100 people vote they need the votes of 60 people in order to retain uh, their job. There is no technical statute of limitations with respect to complaints made uh, about a lawyer at ARDC, but the truth is that the longer you wait, the more difficult it is going to be able to uh, assemble documentation and proof in support of your uh, complaint, and it's also not fair to that attorney. Uh, Attorneys are required to keep files for X number of years, but you know, you wait 10 years to complain about uh, a lawyer, you, they're probably going to tell you it's way past the time they could do anything. I would agree with uh, Judge Jackson. Um, as far as a judge term is six years, I believe there's been one judge in Illinois' history who was up for retention who did not get. Uh, who, doubt, who did not win his election. So I think it is very hard, it is very hard for a judge once you're in there to take a, good, take a judge out unless that judge did something that's worthwhile for the community to stand up and get that judge out of there. Uh, I would also agree with Judge Jackson. Um, you should file if you wanna file a complaint against someone. It's always better to do it right away. Uh, the longer you wait, you know, it probably is gonna hurt your case, hurt your memory and things like that. We still had the question of whether or not you believe in term limits. So we understand now the cycle of how they're retained. Do you believe that there should be a term limit? Yes or no, I guess. No, I don't, because there is a mechanism for getting somebody out of office that you don't think they ought to be there. When they come up for retention, you vote them out. So I don't think there needs to be any. No, I don't believe in term limits for judges. I would agree there is, there is a mechanism in place for, um, for the community to get judges out of office. I mean, if the terms right now, there are, there are six year terms. So after those six years, you can get a judge out of office, I believe. If the communities would like shorter terms, that's something that the legislation would have to uh, draw up and change the laws and how they are. For both of you guys then, how many cases have you tried at w and at what court level? As a state's attorney, again, our court calls are somewhere between 30 to 40, sometimes even 50 cases per day. Uh, we don't keep track of the number of trials because there are so many trials that happen every single day. So again, I'm responsible for anywhere from 30 to 50 families who are depending on me on a day-to-day -day basis to fight for their rights. And also the defendants are depending on me as well as a state's attorney to make sure that I'm being fair. So unfortunately, no, I do not say an exact, I can't say an exact number, but there is a, 
high volume of cases, there's a high volume of trials that we are responsible for and that I have done that's both bench and jury trials. And my cases have all been at the state, at the state level now. I've tried cases in both state court and federal court. And if you're talking about jury trials, upwards of 100 jury trials at both the state and federal level. Now, if you're talking about non-jury trials, then over the course of all the years I tried cases, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands. So I'm not sure which uh, type the questioner is asking about, but a lot of them. And I've tried every kind of case from a parking picket to death penalty. The longest case I was ever on trial with was nine months, actually in the courtroom, up on our feet every day, nine months. Would, would, you, would, you, support your, would you support your opponent if you did not win? Of, of course I'd support my opponent if I did not win. My opponent, if he wins, he becomes a judge of the circuit court of Cook County. We're all in this together. Our job is to do a better job for the community that we serve. So yes, uh, th this is the primary. There is no Republican, so if you win the primary, he's going on the bench. If I win the primary, I'm going, I'm already on the bench, I'm just moving up the next level. And yes, I would definitely support Judge Jackson. Uh, it's been a great experience, uh, even though we go toe to toe at some of these forums, but I will support Judge Jackson. She's a supporter of mine, and it's nice to have known her along the campaign trail. Okay, another question from the audience. Do you think there's a relationship between the lack of diversity on the bench and the high number of African Americans African-American males that are currently incarcerated, why or why not? There are some things judges shouldn't say. Race matters in this country. It always has. Unfortunately, it probably always will. But I don't think it is the lack of diversity on the bench that creates the problem. Judges do not arrest people. Police officers arrest people. And so when I get on my bench in the morning, whoever the police arrested, that's who I see. Do I have problems with the fact that our jails are full of African American males, if that's what somebody's asking me? You bet I do. But I don't think it's a problem that the judiciary alone can address. That is a problem that we have to address with first the police and then the state's attorney's office, and I'm not talking about this young man because he's not the one always making the decision about what shows up on his bench. As a state's attorney, I have experience. Um, there, is, there is a I guess there is a majority, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of the people in the jails are African-American men. Uh, in the court systems, the state's attorney's office, there is not a huge amount of African-American men as far as public defenders or as far as even on the bench, you don't see a lot of African-American male judges. But I don't think we can point the problem in one direction. You know, the problem is in our, com it's in our community where we have to start first because education is a big deal and that's what we do have to push in our communities. There is a, there is a big difference, there is a disconnect, big, big disconnect, you know, being an African-American male, being a state's attorney, I'm in court, a lot of times defendants like talking to me because they know I will be straight with them, I will tell them the truth. You know, I have more defendants come up and just ask me about their case, knowing that I'm the one prosecuting them on the other side. Uh, would you favor or oppose a system in which all sentencing decisions were routinely posted online and indexed by the name of the judge? Well, I think all judicial systems are uh, public information um, now. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with a system where that judge's opinion is placed online. I'm pretty sure one day the county will be in a position where all decisions will be online. Yes, with the exception of juvenile cases. We should not be reporting in public what happens in juvenile court. Okay, okay thank you. 
Uh, do you believe if a defendant that complies with daily reporting, <coughs> excuse me, that the sentence should be deferred? In other words, given supervision or probation instead of uh, time? As a state's attorney, our bosses have always taught us to do what's fair, and that's what I make it a point to do. Uh, every case is different, but if someone, if it's a nonviolent crime or even some crimes, if they qualify for deferred prosecution, if the victims are okay with that, if the families are okay, then that's something that uh, my office and myself, we are always willing to do, or supervision or reduce charges, but every case is different, and we, I do the best I can to make sure that everyone is treated fairly. Now, some cases are not uh, type of cases you want to give people supervision for. We're not going to give supervision to child molesters. Now, if we're not talking about child molesters or murderers or, you know, armed robbers, those cases are not appropriate for supervision. Now, we're talking about little theft cases. We talked about kids with little bitty amounts of marijuana, small drug cases. Of course, supervision ought to be available to them. And there's been a recent change in the law that will allow that to happen more. Courts used to have to have the permission of the state's attorney uh, with respect to supervision. That has to happen since January 1st. I don't have to seek the approval of the state's attorney before I can put a kid on supervision. Okay. Uh, this question will be for uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Shelby. What kinds of challenges did you face as a newcomer, newcomer to the process, and how did you overcome these challenges? Uh, being a newcomer to the political system here in Chicago, it, I did face uh, quite a few challenges. You know, I've, I've been approached by um, multiple people telling me to step down, wait my turn, they will help me on the next round. Um, I've been approached with my signatures, people telling me my boss won't have my back if my signatures were fraudulent. So it's just a lot of political games that are played. That are played. Um, I face these challenges just by, you know, relying on the community, relying on the people that have helped me, and just, you know, I prayed about it, I stayed focused, um, and that's all I did. I kept my head up, and I continue to do what I'm here to do. Okay, and then this next question for you, uh, Judge Jackson. What steps do you take to help a person avoid a felony conviction before you hand out a judgment? Well, uh, I deal with juveniles, and so uh, juveniles don't wind up with quote unquote felony convictions. Juveniles, of course, get convicted of matters that if they were adults, they would be felony uh, convictions. And I'm gonna try everything in the book and then some before I send a kid to the Department of Juvenile Justice. We're gonna try supervision, we're gonna try probation, we're gonna try probation in my courtroom two or three times, which just sends some of the probation officers up the wall, but I believe that's what we're supposed to do. Then we got <coughs> intensive probation, we're gonna try uh, community service, we're gonna try all sorts of things. And even in those instances when I send a kid to the Department of Juvenile Justice, I employ something called the bring back. You know, I send them for 60 days, come back with a report, let me see what you've been doing. 90 days, come back with a report. And if it's a good report, then I take that kid, I vacate the commitment to the Department of Juvenile Justice, put the kid back on probation, and in that way, the kid avoids winding up on parole. Okay, and this question is for both of you guys, and, and I know you'll have a different perspective because you're not a sitting judge at all, correct, correct. Mr. Shell? Okay. What changes do you think need to be made in both the Illinois uh, criminal and juvenile code? If that makes sense. So let's start off with uh, Judge Jackson, please. I think I heard some judges talk about this earlier. It is unethical and against the canons of ethics for judges to talk about what types of changes in the law they would like to see. And there's a very good reason for that. Let's say I believe everybody ought to have a pooper scooper. And then a case shows up in my courtroom one day and the man is accused of not having a pooper scooper. Now do you think he's gonna think he's gonna get a fair shake 
from the woman who took a position as a judge about whether or not he ought to have a pooper scoop. That's why it's unethical and it's not right for judges to talk about what we think, you know, the law to be. We, we required to stay in our own lane, to use a language that is, you know, my language, the lane is the judiciary. It is up to the legislature to determine what it is that they think ought to be done. Now, if they call me down to Springfield and ask me for an opinion, that's different. But me sitting up here and just starting off a conversation about what I think the changes in the law ought to be, that's not something I can do. Uh, this one to both of you guys. What is your position on judges pushing for resources for individuals serving life that cannot have their brief read due to not having any monies, though they have a good case? And we ask this of the appellate excuse me, court uh, judges as well, or candidates as well. An individual is already serving life but they have a good case that needs to be read. I think that would be the appellate court. Uh, but they don't have the money to bring that case to court. Do you believe that judges should be pushing for resources for those individuals who are injured or just cannot afford the cost of giving, having that legal counsel take them up to the appellate court? I mean, do we need to find resources for our community? Uh, who have good cases, but the cases cannot be heard because they cannot afford to get their attorney to bring it to the, to, to in, in front of the judge? Well, I think that would be a good thing. I think that is something more of a community uh, issue, maybe something we can take up, maybe we can talk to our state representatives and get some legislation where there is more money to help out people that are in those type of predicaments. You know, judges do appoint the public defenders, judges do appoint uh, private attorneys to help out people that can't afford an attorney. But a situation like that, I think it would be great if we did have more resources to help out the people in our community. But again, that may be something more so for a state representative or someone to take on and look at and develop more funds to help out those individuals. I'm not sh quite sure at what uh, stage in the process the questioner is talking about because everybody is entitled to counsel on appeal. You get convicted of a crime, your case goes to the appellate court, you're entitled to be represented by uh, counsel. Now, if you don't like what the appellate court does and you're trying to take it to the Supreme Court, that might be a whole different story at that point in the game. Uh, with post-conviction petitions. That's when your case has already been to the appellate court, it's been to the Supreme Court, or you tried to get it into the Supreme Court, and now you come back, you start all over again with the trial court. Frequently, judges appoint lawyers for post-conviction work. So I don't know how many times the questioner is envisioning that they've tried to get their case up to the highest level. Uh, do I think that we ought to appoint them a lawyer every time they've tried to do it and this is the, the, the 12th, the 13th, the 14th time they've tried to do it? I'm not sure about that. Everyone who's running for office, they always say, I live in this community, I, ra I was raised in this community, I am a product of this community. I want to know, since everyone who's running for the seventh sub circuit must live in this community. Give me a timeline of your life. You went to what grade school, what high school, uh, and where are you living now? I wanna know if you live in the city of Chicago. And I want to know what are you going to do? I know people work with different organizations and people help children, but I want to know specifically what you are going to do to help the children of the West Side Thanks. in the seventh sub circuit? Uh, as, as far as the timeline, I was born and raised right on Central and Division. I attended uh, St. Angela Elementary School. I attended Providence St. Mill College. I attended Providence St. Mill High School. I attended Morehouse College, and I attended Chicago Kent College of Law. Um, as far as what my candidacy, candidacy is about, it's about inspiring the youth. I know myself, a lot of people say I'm young, 
but I feel that my candidacy can inspire and touch the hearts of the young people around there. I feel I'm answering the community's call. Every community meeting I go to, someone, people talk about the problems that our youth are having, all of the problems, and it is, it is sad. But people talk about that, and I feel I'm answering that call. I plan on serving as a role model. I hope to inspire other young kids. The other day, I was out campaigning, and I spoke to a young man. He had just got his associate's degree, and he asked me, why was I running for judge? I talked with him, I explained to him why I was running for judge, and at the end of our conversation, he told me if I can do all that, he said he can go back to school and get his college degree. So that's what my candidacy is about. It's about inspiring our youth. I will continue to speak at uh, community outreach programs. I will continue to speak at career days. I will continue to coach uh, youth basketball. Uh, as far as where I'm living at now, I, I did. I just bought a home. I bought a two flat out in Berwyn. Uh, I've been born and raised on the west side of Chicago. One thing growing up, you know, I always wanted to buy my mother a house. Uh, unfortunately, on a state's attorney's salary, I couldn't do that. Uh, as we were looking for properties, she said she wanted, didn't want to be exactly in the city. She wanted to be a little outside of the city, being that she does have arthritis and can't get around as much. I bought her a two flat, so now I currently do live in Berwyn, but I am still an active part of the west side of Chicago. My mother brought me to the West Side when I was six years old. I went to Our Lady of Sorrows, and when they couldn't afford to keep us in that school anymore, I went to Calhoun, the old one. I went to Tennyson. I graduated from Delano High School. I went across Garfield Park to Marshall High School. I spent four years at Marshall High School, home of the commandos. Yay, commandos. But um, I live in the city now. I live in Austin. I live right in the middle of the kids that I deal with every day, and all of them know where the judge lives, and they know the, the judge's rules. If you see me out in my yard, you can come up to the fence, you can talk about me, talk to me. You can't talk about any cases you have pending in my courtroom. You can talk about anything else. You got problems at school, something's going on with you at home, something good happened to you, you can talk to me about that. They recognize my car, I'm driving up and down the street, they screaming, hey judge, and I wave back at them. I'd like to believe that I, too, am a role model. I tell kids every day, the difference between you and I is age and education. If I don't have the education, I'm not sitting in this chair. So I'm also trying to be a role model. I tell kids, I know this is not easy. It wasn't easy for me. When I left Marshall High School and went to Northwestern University, I had people tell me, you cannot hope to succeed. Well, they were wrong. I had law professors tell me at the University of Illinois where I went to law school that I could not hope to succeed. They were wrong. I had visions of being a trial lawyer. When I graduated from law school 40 years ago, there were fewer than 500 African American women practicing law in this country, not here in the state of Illinois, or the city of Chicago, all across this country. There were people who told me I couldn't do that then. They were wrong. And so I tell kids, you cannot let other people define who you are going to be. And where you come from does not determine where it is that you are going. You are the only one who is entitled to make the decision about where you're going. So where I'm going, back to 207 North Menard. That's where I live, that's where I'm gonna stay. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're gonna, what, what I do wanna bring to our audience's attention is on the back of your handout, you did get some uh, parts of the bios of the candidates. This was sort of like a uh, sample ballot for you to make your notes. You'll have an opportunity to speak to the candidates once uh, we uh, end this part of the forum. Uh, and we're hoping that you take the opportunity to get to know the candidates so that you can have a better perspective ear to ear, face to face. So we want to thank the candidates again for coming out. All three were invited. We have two here today. And for the two that are here today, we want to thank you again. We will now allow you one minute to close it up. And uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. One minute. Uh, my opponents have been telling people she's already a judge, so she doesn't need this spot. I'm not running for the same position I already have. I'm not nuts. They're different. And the reason they are different are there are privileges and benefits that are accorded to circuit court judges that are not accorded to associate judges like I am. We don't get to vote in elections that are held within the court system, and I could live with that. 
They make more money than me. I could even live with that, although I wouldn't turn my back on the $8,500 a year that they make more than me. But the real difference is, is the career advancement and opportunities. There are 17 presiding judges in the Circuit Court of Cook County. None of them are associate judges. Is it written anywhere in the rules that an associate can't be? No. But you can believe there's that little sign on the door that when those positions open up, what it says is associates need not apply in essence. That is why I'm doing this. I want to put myself in a position that if and when the presiding judge at juvenile court decides that they don't want to do that anymore, that I can go to Judge Evans and say, I want to be the next presiding judge of the Juvenile Justice Division. There's never been a presiding judge from the west side of the city of Chicago, and I think there ought to be. I think it ought to be me. My background and my experience says it should be me. All of my ratings from the bar evaluations say that I am highly recommended, highly prepared for this position. All of them say that. I am endorsed by Congressman Danny K. Davis, my alderman, Deborah Graham, my state representative, LaShawn K. Ford, Commissioner Bobby Steele. I have the background, I have the experience. I'm not gonna have to go to new judges school. I'm gonna be prepared on day one because I'm already doing the job. That is why I think I need to be the next judge of what elected from the Seventh Judicial Sub Circuit. I think when we go out to vote, we should always vote for the candidate, not just this race, but in every race, vote for the candidate that will mean the most to your community. My candidacy is not about me. It's about the community. I'm not running for judge because I want to gain some power. I'm running for judge because I want to answer our leader's call. I want to help inspire our youth. I want to encourage other young people to do what you want to do. If you have a goal, you run, you, if you have a goal, you do what it takes to get there. Don't let anyone encourage you. So I think I'm different in that sense on the reason why I'm running. Like I said, this is not, it's not about me, it's about the community. Now, I can't sit here and tell you I have 30 or 40 years of experience. I don't think any of you would believe me, but I can't do that. But what I can tell you, if elected, I have 30 or 40 years of service to offer this community as a public servant. I have been committed to public service uh, my entire legal career and before that, my entire life. Uh, one of my greatest accomplishments was in one of my greatest accomplishments in attending Morehouse College was being a Bonner Scholar. As a Bonner Scholar, we were required to do 150 hours of community service while representing the college. And that's one of the best things I take away from Morehouse College is my commitment to service. Now, I'm out of time, so I just want to say that I am highly qualified, I am committed to this community, and I look forward for your support. Thank you. And to the candidates, we want to thank you for your time. And to the audience, we want to thank you for your time. Hold on, hold on a second, you guys. Can we get your attention one, one minute? One minute. One minute. It's not even going to take a minute for me to say okay. this. We want you to vote. But your vote ought to be for somebody that's in this room. We don't need people brought in from outside the seventh sub-circuit by the Democratic Party over here to run. We have competent, qualified people right here on the west side. Yeah. I'm not relying, he's not relying on who my father was or who they know. We don't have this sense of entitlement or to get it because of who I am or who I'm related to. And we are trying to urge you. The next judge ought to be standing in this room. <laughs>